That's hard to follow. It's a little intimidating. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Daryl Stein. I'm the Klein Campus Pastor, and I'm glad you came here to join us in worship today, and thank you for joining us online as well. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to the book of Colossians. Uh, Colossians is a New Testament book. It's about a little more than halfway through your New Testament. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. If you don't have your Bible with you, we'll have the words up here on the screen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 17. And the title of today's message is All Dressed Up with Somewhere to Go. So let's read verses, verse 12 first. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, that you've given us um, what you want us to know, how to live as your chosen people. And Lord, I pray right now that you would just remind us again of what our behavior should be with each other and in this world. And we ask all this in the name of our King Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> so, true story. Okay, true story. Um, I'm pretty transparent. For those of you who know me, uh, I don't really hold a lot back. So, <clears throat> it was the morning of my 30th birthday. It was kind of a warm May morning. A little breezy outside. We're going to have a lot of family over to celebrate my birthday. So I go outside early in the morning to pick up the garden hose and sprinkler because I was going to mow the lawn. <clears throat> so I go outside and uh, cars are driving by, you know, and I pick up the hose, take the sprinkler off, starting to wrap up the hose, and my hand brushes against my thigh, and I thought, that's weird. Why did I feel skin on skin? So I look down, I go, shirt, check, shoes, check. Underwear, check. Shorts, shorts. <laughs> I was not wearing any shorts. <clears throat> so I made a quick dash to the front door. I grabbed the door handle. It's locked. Oh, great. So I run around then to the side of the house, going towards the back door. My neighbors are coming out of their house and thinking, oh, my gosh, they're going to call the cops. Okay. So I run back to the front door. I start ringing the doorbell like crazy. My wife comes to the door on the other side. Who is it? And I go, it's me. Let me in. <clears throat> so she opens the door, and then she goes, what are you? She's on the phone, right? She goes, what are you doing in your underwear? I'm like, just let me in the house. She goes, Mama, I got to call you back. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun birthday. Everyone knew about it by the time they got to the house. <laughs> yeah, thank you for listening. My therapist says it's really helpful if I get this out and tell it over and over again. <laughs> she says it's part of the healing process, so thank you. Right? But the, really... The truth is, is that God calls us as his children, as, as believers, to wear certain virtues as clothing. And so today, we're going to talk about what those items of clothing are. Now, in the verses that are immediately preceding this, Paul talks to the people at Colossae, to the church there, and tells them certain things that they need to be taking off, certain behaviors, things such as anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene speech, and lying. So think about if you're outside in a hot summer morning, you're all sweaty, your clothes are all filthy, coming in and taking off those dirty, filthy old clothes and putting on new ones. And so what are the new clothes? What are those clean clothes that we are supposed to wear as Jesus followers in this world? And Paul is going to tell us that today. So real quick, I want to tell you that, that if you are not a Christian, if you don't follow Jesus, this message is not for you. You can just sit back and relax because it's for, it's for everyone else. But if you are not a Jesus follower, I still encourage you to listen. Because you'll be able to tell them when I'm done how Christians ought to be acting toward each other and towards you as well as someone who has not chosen to follow Jesus yet. So I've got two points today. And the first one is this. Clothe yourself in Christian virtues. Clothe yourselves in Christian virtues. Verses 12 through 14. Let's read here. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so you must do also. In addition to all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So Paul starts, starts out here saying that we've been chosen by God. And the basis for all of this is that God loves you and loves me, and he chose us. And because we are chosen of God, we are his elect. Now, this is a special term used in the Old Testament 
to refer to God's people. But now that Christ came and died on the cross, non-Jews, Gentiles, we're allowed then to be part of this family and be chosen by him through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So what kind of people, what kind of people does God choose to be his own? I tell you what, I am so glad it's not perfect people because I would not have been chosen. And neither would you, right? So what kind of people does God choose to be his own? God chooses sinful people. God chooses sinners like you and like me. But specifically here, let, let's put a fine point on this. What kind of sinful people does God choose to be his own? God chooses adulterers like King David. He chooses murderers like King David, Moses, and Paul. He chooses deceivers such as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He chooses thieves like the one who hung on the cross next to Jesus. He chooses prostitutes like Rahab. And he chooses persecutors like Paul and other types of sinners. See, God did not choose you and he did not choose me. Because we meet some type of standard, okay? He did not choose to save you and save me because we are a good person, whatever, whatever that means. He chose you and me out of his own free will because he loves us. And now let me speak to those of you here or online who may not be Christians, but you're listening. Maybe, maybe you've chosen not to follow Jesus yet because you're waiting. You're just waiting for that time that you get your act cleaned up just enough to where Christ will come and he will accept you. Well, here's the thing. I've got some bad news. See, you're right. Christ will not accept you in your condition because you think that you're not good enough. And I've got some even worse news for you. See, you're never going to be good enough. But I've got some good news for you. See, here's the thing. God loves you no matter what you've done. And he wants to save you. And he's got an incredible plan for you and for your life here. And God loves you, not because of what you've done, but because of who you are. See, God loves you so much, but he loves you too much to keep you in the lifestyle that you're living right now. He wants you to turn away from your sin, to put your faith and trust in his son, Jesus Christ, who paid the price of your sin and for my sin so that you can be forgiven and be with him in heaven for all of eternity. So if you're waiting to be good enough, my friends, you are going to be waiting for the rest of your life because you never will be good enough. Today, my friend, today, make this the day that you choose to try and be a good person. Give up that time and choose to follow Christ instead because God loves you. And so as God's chosen people here, we're supposed to exhibit a certain type of behavior. You see, we are living advertisements to what Christ has done in us and to us and through us. So Paul uses this term holy here. And it, it's not used to describe a moral accomplishment. We're not super special saint people, right? We're holy because God has set us apart. That's really what that means. God sets his people apart for his purpose. See, if you go to a store and you buy something, you are the purchaser. As the purchaser, you have bought that thing and you can do with that thing whatever you want because you are the owner. When you choose to follow Jesus Christ, you're under new management. You have a new owner. You were bought with the price. You are not your own. And so Christ says, you need to live for me. I control you. All right? You are set apart for service for me. And not only are you holy and set apart, you are beloved. See, we're set apart because God loves you and God loves me. And you know what? Thank goodness God's love is not based on our performance. He would have stopped loving me a long time ago. And maybe you've been in some kind of dysfunctional relationship where the other person loves you or likes you or does nice things for you based on how you behave. That is messed up, right? But thank God, God does not treat us like that because we sin every day. But God continues to love us and he always will love us. And so knowing that we are chosen, knowing we are holy, and knowing that we are beloved, how then do we treat one another? Well, Paul then, he gives us five different virtues that we're supposed to be living by, five different virtues we're supposed to close ourselves with. And the first one is this, a heart of compassion. We're called to imitate God in mercy and compassion. So compassion means to feel sympathy and concern for the sufferings and misfortunes of others. See, Paul was writing in, in a time where the ancient world was merciless. Okay, the sick and aged were discarded. 
and the mentally ill were treated in inhumane ways. But Christianity came along with an entirely different message that turned the Greek and Roman world upside down. See, famine and war had devastated the large city of Caesarea. And the plague had set in in the early 4th century. And so people in the city began to leave in droves and flee to the countryside to get away from everything. But what happened is though there was one group of people left behind to care for those who could not leave. And so the bishop of that city, he's an early church historian named Eusebius. And Eusebius wrote this. All day long, some of them, the Christians, tended to the dying and to their burial, countless numbers with no one to care for them. Others gathered together from all parts of this city, a multitude of those withered from famine, and they distributed bread to them all. See, Christianity has always been and still is countercultural. We carry a message that is so different from what this world has to offer. And then Paul goes on and uses the word kindness then. And the word here really means goodness, kindliness, and graciousness. But you know, this doesn't happen naturally in our relationships, does it? A great example of this is the Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw. He wrote a letter to Winston Churchill, and he said this, Enclosed are two tickets to the opening night of my first play. Bring a friend, if you have one. So Winston Churchill replied, Dear Mr. Shaw, Unfortunately, I will be unable to attend the opening night of your play due to a prior engagement. Please send me tickets for a second night, if you have one. Right? <clears throat> so there's probably some playfulness there. I, I get it. Right? But on our own, naturally, our conversations, our personalities, how we treat one another, we usually descend into harshness of words and deeds. But because of love and mercy and kindness and grace and goodness that Christ has shown us, we should naturally display those to others as well. Paul goes on to use the word humility. Okay? And so when he talks about humility here, it's an attitude of serving and the giving of oneself to others. In fact, Christ modeled this perfectly here. It says he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross. So again, remember Paul was writing at a time when the Greeks were in power and the Greeks never used the word humility to describe themselves. Humility was a sign of weakness. But Christ elevated it to the apex of godly virtues. See, the world says, look out for number one. Get what you can for yourself. But Christianity teaches, put the needs of others before your own. Humility, is, humility describes people who live not to satisfy their own demands, but to serve the needs of others. And humility allows us, allows us to serve others without caring who gets the credit. You ever... You ever been around an, an attention hound, right? They want to be seen. They want to be known. They want all the attention for themselves. And Christ says, no, 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 no. You do the work. Let someone else get the credit. But ultimately, really, in the end, all credit goes to Christ himself, right? That's where we need to be pointing to. And humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. Wow, what a different message that is that we're hearing out in the world. Paul also uses the word gentleness, or maybe your translation says, says meekness. Meekness is not weakness, it's power under control. It was a word used at the time to describe like a soothing wind or a healing medicine or a cult that has been broken. But in each instance there's power because, you see, a, a wind can quickly become a storm. Too much medicine can kill, and a wild horse can break loose and run free. Paul is talking about power under control. So gentleness is the opposite of arrogance. It's the opposite of self-assertiveness here. It cares for the rights and feelings of others. And then he uses this word patience, which is a long temper. The short-tempered person speaks and acts impulsively and lacks self-control. Now don't get me wrong, there are appropriate times when it's okay to get mad. Okay, at the right time, at the right thing. But it's wrong to get angry quickly and at the wrong things. So, for example, we should be angry when we hear stories about human trafficking. We should not tolerate that. That should anger us and motivate us into action. But it's not good to lose your temper and to yell when someone cuts you off. Okay, I'm going to be, again, I'll be transparent, right? I get road rage sometimes pushing my cart through Walmart, all right? Because I'll, yeah, okay, good. You, you are with me, good. All right? So, <clears throat> but it is wrong for us to be quick tempered and lose 
our temper here and lose patience. And so we need to put on these five graces because they're perfectly worn by Christ. And here's the thing too. Paul intends for all these characteristics, all these graces to be worn in community. How much easier it would be if we could wear them without being around other people, right? It's easier to think about compassion than to do it. It's easier to put on humility and gentleness if we weren't being jostled about by the proud and the arrogant. And how much easier it is for us to practice patience in isolation. But see, that's not the way it works. You see, Christians become better Christians in community. We become better Christians in our families, in the workplace, in our college dorms, and in our churches when we always wear these particular virtues. And so in verse 13, Paul tells us to bear with one another. So this exemplifies patience in action, right? We're to bear with, we're to put up with other people who don't agree with us. And so surprise of all surprises, did you know you will actually encounter people in life who actually have different opinions than you? Can you believe that? Isn't that crazy? And so bless your heart if you don't think so. Everyone should think the same way you do, right? But they don't, right? So he says that we are to bear with them. We are to seek to understand them without judging them. And so I recently discovered this really neat trick on social media, okay? So I'm going to tell it to you right now. You may not know about it. I recently discovered it myself, okay? Here it is, all right? Did you know that you can see something on Instagram and on Twitter and on Facebook that you don't agree with, and you can simply just keep scrolling? Isn't that crazy? I, know, I mean, before I thought, well, I've got to let this idiot know what I'm thinking. They're obviously wrong, and I need to point to them. I point out to them just how wrong they were and just how stupid they are for thinking what they're thinking. Surely they'll change their mind. And then I went, so I, wait, what? And it let me keep going, and I didn't have to comment. And I thought, this is really weird. And then I tried it out on Snapchat. Did you know that on Snapchat, if you see something you don't agree with, swipe, you don't have to swipe up? You don't have to swipe up. You can keep going. TikTok, man, you see something you don't like, just keep on going until you find videos of little puppy dogs doing really neat tricks and everything, right? You don't have to turn around and, and blast people with both barrels that you don't agree with. Because you know what? They're putting up with you too. I know y'all look great. Y'all look really good. But we put up with y'all too, right? We are to bear with one another. And so... We're to bear with each other, especially as brothers and sisters in the Lord. So I'm reminded of this old poem, and it's so true. To live above with the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints we know, well, that's another story. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. My brothers and sisters, the church ought to be the one place where we bear with one another in love. Paul next tells us that our lives should be marked by forgiveness. And, you know, it's not enough simply to put up with each other, to refuse retaliation. No, we actually absolutely have to forgive one another. And if we struggle with this, we have to recall the immense forgiveness that Christ showed each one of us. So understanding and tolerance need to be fortified by Christian forgiveness. We are to forgive other people. And the specific word that Paul uses here conveys gracious forgiveness. The implication is that we forgive even when the other person doesn't deserve it. Mm -mm -mm. That is hard. But dear, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how much they hurt me. See, you don't understand because you haven't been, you haven't dealt, you haven't been dealing with this. You haven't been treated like this. I may not understand, but I know who does. And that's my Savior Jesus. Because your sin and my sin, it hurt him deeply. So much so that he had to pay for that with his life. So when we talk about forgiving, we have an example. And that's Christ who forgave us so much. You see, the problem is, I, th I think the problem is we don't think we're as bad as we really are. I didn't think we have a real good sense of just how much our sin had separated us from God. And I'm so grateful that God was patient with me that he was forbearing with me, but he put up with me and he forgave me. After 33 years of living in rebellion against him, he picked me up from the trash heap of my sin and my filth and all the garbage that I walked around in and says, you don't belong here. 
you're a child of the king, and I love you, and I want you to follow my son. And so how grateful I am for that forgiveness. Is it easy? No. It is not easy to forgive at times. Because here's the thing, we want that other person to pay for what they've done to us. They don't deserve it. We're the judge. We're the arbiter. We get to decide when we think they suffered enough to earn our forgiveness. But here's the thing. When you don't forgive, you know what you're doing? You're building a prison cell, you're closing the door, and you're locking yourself in. And you're there, and you're locked up in your own prison, and they're out there free. Put another way to unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping the other person will die. You ever, you ever been driving down the road, someone cuts you off, and you get really mad, and man, you're letting that person have it flashing the lights, honking the horn, yelling at them, throwing those arms up everywhere, right? And they they just go on their way, right? And they're not even thinking about you. They go on their merry way, and you're mad. You're thinking about that all the way to work here. You get to work, and you start telling your coworkers about some idiot who cut you off, and you're thinking about that, and you're mad, and you're stuck back at that instance. Another person has moved on. That's what happens when you hold on to unforgiveness. See, you're stuck back at that time that person hurt you, and they have moved on with life, and you're keeping yourself prisoner. So how do we know? How do we know then that we've truly forgiven someone if we think, okay, I've forgiven this person? I found this great article by a man named Ron Edmondson. He gives us five tests to see if we have forgiven someone. First one is this, the first thought test. What is the first thought that you have about that person when they come to your mind? Is it to injure them, or is it a good thought? If it's to injure them, you probably have not truly forgiven that person. What about the opportunity to help them test? If you had the opportunity to help them, would you? Again, not saying you should put yourself in harm's way, not saying that you should hold yourself about to be hurt again, but if you had the opportunity and you wouldn't be hurt, would you help that person again? A general thoughts test. Can you think positive thoughts about this person? Can you think anything good about that person? Number four, the revenge test. Do you still think about getting even with that person? Yeah, there may be consequences that are due to them, all right, and maybe they will come, but do you seek revenge and hope they will get it, or do you hope that they will be doing better? And then finally, the failure test. Have you stopped looking for someone to fail? See, if you've truly forgiven someone, you would treat them like, like other people. You want them to succeed and get better in life. And so all these things here, these are marks of how we should be forgiving other people. Is it easy? No. Absolutely not. Can we do it on our own, truly? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that we can. You see, it takes the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit living in us to be able to forgive much. Because you and I have been forgiven much. And so Paul moves on here and talks here about love next in verse 14. And see, love is the most important of these Christian virtues because it ties everything together. You can display one or more or even all these virtues but not love someone. But if you love another person, then these virtues, they will all be there. You will display kindness, compassion, humility, gentleness, patience, and you will bear with one another. Because these were all shown in Christ through us. And if we claim the name Christian, we affirm, we affirm that we are his followers. And if we are his followers, we are imitators. For he is our example. So, in spite of all our differences, the one thing that unites believers all around the world is our love for Christ. Point number two is this. Immerse yourselves in Christ's peace and truth. Let's look first at verse 15. Let the peace of Christ, to which you were indeed called in one body, rule in your hearts and be thankful. So, <clears throat> we're supposed to live in peace with one another. And so, Paul says it's a gift from the Holy Spirit that we are given peace, but we still have to submit to it. Paul says, let the peace of Christ reign in your hearts. When we surrender to the Lordship of Jesus, His peace reigns. And again, Here's the thing here, too, is that he is our Lord. We say Jesus is our Lord and Savior. If he's our Lord, he's our master. And then we are supposed to be doing those things that he commands us. So he gives us peace. And when we submit our lives to him, that's when our lives are marked by 
peace. We have peace in our hearts, and so we can be at peace with others in the church and in our community. And so peace here is really three-dimensional. Okay? It's vertical. It's in our relationship with God. We are to have peace with him. It's horizontal, peace with others. And then finally, it is internal. We're supposed to have peace in our hearts. And then finally, he says we're to be thankful. When there's peace in our hearts, there is praise on our lips. Do you ever notice that when, um, when you lack peace, it's usually because you're feeling there's some unmet need, some unmet expectation you have in your life. Something isn't right. You're feeling dissatisfied. And it's hard to have peace. It's hard to be thankful when you think, gosh, something is just missing here. I don't have this. I don't have peace. I cannot be thankful because I don't think the way things are going the way it should in my life. And it's hard for me to be happy. And I tell you what, we need to let the peace of God reign in our hearts, understanding he's provided all things to us through Christ. And there is no room for ill will or bitterness if thankfulness prevails. In verse 16, Paul says this, Let the word of Christ dwell richly within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So he uses the words dwell, and dwell richly. Okay, the word dwell means to feel at home. Okay, so how do we allow the word of God to dwell richly within us? Well, it begins by reading it. See, the Bible isn't all that difficult to understand, but there are some difficult passages I'm reminded of what Mark Twain wrote one time, and he said this, Most people are bothered by those passages of Scripture which they cannot understand. But as for me, I have always noticed that the passages in Scripture which trouble me most are those which I do understand. Because when we understand it, we're accountable to it. And we have to live by it then. Right? <clears throat> and so, but we need to read the Bible first. Here's the thing, okay? Um... I know I look pretty young. Thank you. Um, but here's, I love texting people, okay? What frustrates me, and maybe, maybe you're like this too, you ever text someone, you know, a really long, long, long text thread here, and you pour your heart out, you tell them all these things, and what do they reply back with? K. Oh, no, you don't. I just pour my, you don't. You tell me more than K, all right? I didn't know you got this. What's even worse, you ever text someone, and you see on your iPhone, it says red, and you don't reply back. And you think, oh, they must be busy. Two hours, four hours, next day goes by. And you see them, and you're like, hey, didn't you read my text message? You're like, yeah. Well, well what? Aren't you going to reply? I don't see a need to, right? And you're like, really? Oh, my gosh, I can't believe you. You read it and everything. Or sometimes they don't even read it. And you're like, hey, I texted you yesterday. Did you get it? Oh, no, let me see. Oh, look, there you are. And it's like, why didn't you write a text message? Right? God gives us his word, the Bible. He expects us to do something with it. He expects us to read it. But my brothers and my sisters, how can the word of Christ dwell richly within us if it stays closed like an te unread text message throughout the week? If you wouldn't dream of not reading a text message from your friend and replying, why is it okay for you to come here, open up the Bible, follow along, close it, go home, leave it closed all week long, and then come back the next week? How can it dwell richly within you if we're like that? So we are supposed to be studying God for it. We're supposed to meditate on it. We're supposed to seek how we can apply it in our lives. And Paul says here that we have to teach. It's the orderly arrangement of truth in order to communicate the facts of it. Okay? And we have some pretty spectacular teachers here at Spring Baptist Church at both our Spring Campus and Klein Campus in our life groups who love teaching God's word. And we also admonish one another. See, admonishing has the element of strong encouragement. Once we're taught God's word, once we know the truth, we're encouraged to put it in action, to do something about it, to let it penetrate our souls and to change our behaviors. And so Paul says that there's a definite relationship between our knowledge of the Bible and our expression of it in worship and in song. And one way that we can teach and encourage one another is through singing. And so music is a vehicle through which God's message is delivered. See, when we sing... We must give primary attention to what is being communicated and not how it's being communicated. 
Unfortunately, I think for many of us, we made worship into a time where we get our needs met. Oh, you're singing my favorite song. Oh, I don't like that kind of music. I don't know why Marty and them insist on playing this stuff. I don't like this kind of music. I'm going to text Marty and tell him, don't you dare play this modern stuff. Again. Right? That text message ain't going to go red. Right? But, so, but here's the thing. When, since when did worship become all about us? Since when did worship become about getting our needs met? And see, the word is God's, the wisdom is God's, and all thanks are due to God alone when we worship him. So I have a challenge for those times when you don't like the music that we play. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, there are some songs that I don't particularly care for that we play. All right. I don't have to like the sound. I don't have to like the volume or the whatever, right? But we have the words up on the screen. And so while I may not like the music, I read the words. And if those words point me back to Scripture, and if those words dwell richly within me, and God speaks to me through those words, through song, then I can worship him back in that. I've got a teenage son who likes to, uh, to listen to Lecrae. Right? Now, I'm no hip-hop fan, I know. Surprise of all surprises, you look at me and go, really? Yes, I know, I'm shocked too that I don't like hip-hop. He listens to that stuff, and I walk through the house, and I'm like, oh, oh, I don't want to hear it. But he's like, Dad, you got to listen to this song. I'm like, oh, okay. And I listen to the words. And I hear the words, and I'm thinking, I agree with that. I agree with that. That's pointing me back to Jesus. That lines up with Scripture. That's right. What he's saying is true. And I'm thinking, you know what? I don't necessarily have to like the, the sound, but I love the words. Because he's spot on and God says, you can worship me in song, Daryl. That's how it's supposed to be in music and song. We're supposed to complement teaching and worship. And so again, we have thankfulness in our hearts to God when we allow his word to dwell in this richly. <clears throat> in verse 17, it says this. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. See, worship is not conducted just in our weekly church service here. It includes what we do in our daily lives. Our lives should be marked by an attitude of worship to the Lord at all times. And by our word and by our works, we should be glorifying his name. And so when we are out in public, we are Christ's representatives. We're his children. And I know parents, you send your kids out and you think, okay, come here, listen to me really carefully. When you go to their house, you don't act all a fool. You don't be acting stupid. You don't say nothing crazy. You be a good representative. Do you understand? They're like, whatever. Right? I got 16s, I know. Right? <clears throat> and so that's the thing is that when you go out in this world, you are Christ's representative. What are your words? What are your actions? What are people seeing? What are people hearing? Are you bringing honor and glory to the Lord? Or are you bringing shame? See, some people work on generations to build up a good family name, and it can be ruined by one generation who brings shame to that family. And so we should be thankful. Our lives should be marked by submission to our sovereign Lord as he fills us, his word dwells us in, in us richly, and we have an attitude of gratitude towards him.